Hello everyone and welcome to this second supplement for Econ 1011 talking about economics and politics. I'm your lecturer David Smerden and I think this is the right time for this supplement because even though we've only had really just a few weeks of economics um, you're already at the point now where you can start to understand the economics fundamentals that underpin the different camps in politics. And it's an important time in your lives now. Um, you're at the age where you'll soon be voting for the first time. Some of you have already voted. Uh, and these formative years during university are generally the time that people start to make up their minds about where their values lie and where they would like to place themselves on the political spectrum. And it might be nice to see how politics and economics um, interact in this respect um, and, and what, their, what their relationship is with each other because they are a lot closer um, than you might think. So you would have heard about the left of politics and the right of politics. In the, in the US, it's very clear they have a, a very um, a concretely divided two-party system and you're either a Republican or you're a Democrat. You're either on the left or you're on the right. And in a lot of countries, you'll have this sort of clean division. They'll talk about whether the government in power is the left-leaning government, the right-leaning government, and so forth. Um, it's interesting to think about First, whether or not it's really as clear cut as that, a single line being the spectrum of political orientation and where you sit on that. Um, but the second thing I think is curious is to talk just about the origins of where this came from in the first place. Um, we didn't always talk about the left and the right, although obviously these sort of concepts of political affiliation have existed for a long time. Its, it's history actually goes back to the French Revolution of the late 17th century. Um, there were a couple of um, very interesting factors that uh, contributed to the build-up in French society that led to probably the most famous revolution um, in, in recent history, well, modern history. Um, there's a very interesting podcast called Revolutions uh, that I highly recommend and the, the third uh, chapter of that focuses very much on the French Revolution. But essentially in the late uh, 1700s, um, things were getting very, very tough for the peasants, the lower class, and also the middle class. Essentially, there was the rich bourgeois um, who were very wealthy and the poor were struggling a lot to the point where they were spending over 80% of their income on bread. Now, we spoke about this before, actually, in the concept of a given good. And indeed, this is one such example where academics have argued um, that the good uh, bread was a given good because there weren't close substitutes to it and as the price of bread rose people became poorer they needed to eat they couldn't afford anything else they were buying more bread so they were actually violating the law of demand in that sense but the revolt got to the point sorry the situation got to the point where people started to revolt um, there was more and more pressure placed on the monarchy at the time and it led to um, sort of a pivotal meeting um, before or during the start of the French Revolution, depending on your definition, where the, Nat the National Assembly of France actually got together around a long rectangular table to discuss what to do about the structure of French society and French government. Now the king sat at the head of the table, even though at that point his powers were significantly diminished, um, as, as were those of his wife, the famous Marie Antoinette. Um, and it just so happened that uh, one faction decided to, to sit uh, on the side to the king's left of the table and the others decided to sit to those on the king's right. Now those wanting to sit on the left were sort of anti-monarchy. They wanted more power to go to the people, more freedom for the people. Um, those sitting on the right were monarchists. Um, they supported uh, King Louis's position and his his position as a, as a figurehead, as the monarch. Um, and they were also a little bit 
less in favor of restrictions, price restrictions. They were more in favor of the free market. So you had those sitting on the left, sitting on the right. Probably it was just whoever wandered into the room first sat on that side, but that's where we got the terms from. And those, um, the characteristics of those two camps around the table also define and still to this day characterize um, the traits that you find for the left side and the right side of politics. And we see that today also in, in um, the way that the government chambers are set up in even the Westminster system around the world, sitting on the left and the right of the, the speaker. Um, although these days it's more to do with who is currently in government um, for which side that they sit on. So going back to the French example, it seems that if you're on the left, you want change. You don't want a monarchy anymore in France. If you're on the right, you want tradition. And certainly the demographics in, in the US with the Republicans and the Democrats also seem to suggest um, older people are more likely to be Republican. Younger people are more likely to be Democrat. It's the same in Australia. You have the um, Liberal National Coalition has a traditionally older base uh, and a richer base. And uh, on the other side of things, Labor and the Greens, a younger, typically poorer base. Not to the same extent that you find in other countries, but again, you have people with an incentive for things to stay how they are and people with an incentive to want things to change. So that seems an easy way to think about the left-right divide, right? Well, the reality is a lot more complicated than that. And if you really want to get some idea of how complex it can be, this picture is a little bit of an eyesore, but gives you some sort of sense about how the left-right divide can be characterized, not just with your views on government and authority and economics, but all the way down to society and culture, what the family unit means, what morals mean in a society, the role of religion and belief and equality and so forth. So obviously the left-right divide encompasses a lot more than simply keeping the status quo versus a desire for change. The normal way that it's looked at in political science is along two dimensions. So you end up with a four quadrant political spectrum. Now we've got the familiar terms left and right there on the horizontal axis, but we've also got a vertical axis with authority and liberty. So, okay, authority and liberty, that seems to make sense. Do you want the government to have more control over people's lives or do you want to allow more personal freedom? Makes sense. But then what does the left-right um, thing mean on, on the horizontal axis? Well, the vertical one is left-right in terms of personal freedom, but the horizontal one is looking at economics. And that's where we see this strong interconnection between economics and politics. Are you a left-leaning economic person or a right-leaning economic person? And what we've seen so far in this course is we've seen just from basic economics 101 how different sides of politics pick the theories that most support the position that they want from economics. So when we looked at, say, lectures one, two, three, four, with a particular focus on market equilibrium in perfectly competitive markets, we spoke a lot about why government intervention was bad, how perfectly competitive markets led to the maximum efficiencies for society. We had a Pareto optimal situation in which there was no dead weight loss and in which the market mechanism of the invisible hand, as Adam Smith would put it, or the price mechanism, maximizes the welfare for your society, both in terms of the producer surplus and the consumer surplus without making anyone else worse off. So those basic principles support those on the economic right, those who believe in free markets and liberalism. On the left, we start to think about all of the sorts of problems we've been discussing in recent weeks where perfect competition falls down for different reasons. Maybe there are barriers to entry and we've got a monopoly or monopolistic competition, for example. Or maybe there are externalities such as pollution or so forth, in which case, again, we can see that people are overproducing in society uh, and government intervention through, say, a tax or so forth would reduce production and bring it closer to the actual socially optimal level. So again, everything that you've learned so far um, 
is is the underpinning of either side of um, the political economics uh, spectrum in terms of left and right. So when we look at this this spectrum, this sort of um, four quadrant political spectrum or political compass, we can start to compare across countries. And this can be done quantitatively using data that's readily available. It makes for some graphs that are a bit of an eyesore, so apologies for this one coming up. But I find them quite interesting to look at because you know, we care about the world, we care about these things, politics and economics, if you're in this course. Um, it's interesting to see where our country sits and where other countries we might be familiar with uh, also sit. So where's Australia? Well, it's actually hanging pretty close to my shoulder, actually, it's down here. You can see we're down near the bottom right corner. So in terms of political authority, we're pretty liberal. We have a lot of freedom in this country to do whatever we want. In terms of economic freedom, we're very much on the right. So we are still a capitalist country, not much government regulation. Business has a lot of power in Australia, so fairly um, free market, free market loving. In fact, surprisingly free market loving, I would say. I didn't expect us to be so far on the right that we're even a bit further to the economic right than the United States. Um, right, then you can see, for example, looking uh, directly vertically up from Australia, you'll reach some of the Asian countries there in red, Singapore and Hong Kong, countries that are far more authoritarian in terms of governmental power over personal freedom. But actually, when it comes to economic freedom, they're very similar to Australia in terms of being on the economic right in favor of capitalism and free markets. What about China? China is obviously a very interesting example people might guess it to be up in the top left corner. If you look right up in the top left corner, you'll see North Korea up there. Well, it is top, but it's actually quite central in terms of the left-right divide. So it's top in terms of political authority, and the government has a lot of power and that it can exert on personal freedom. It can ban websites, it can lock down protests and so forth. But in terms of economics, it has moved from the left to the right um, slowly but surely, uh, actually not even that slowly, since the time of Mao Zedong um, until now. So during its recent development, it has really moved more to the economic right. And actually, even though it still looks like that's on the left of the graph, um, if you look at the actual axes, it's close to the 50% mark, meaning that about half the countries in the world are to the left of China and half to the right in terms of economic freedom. And what about France? France, who gave us the terms left and right to begin with? Well, it's actually somewhere in the middle between um, Australia and China. It's far more on the political um, freer side of things, personal, personal freedom, although not as much as Australia, which kind of surprised me because protesting is seen as a civil right in, in, in France. Um, but also it is a little bit more socialist in terms of its economic dimensions, certainly than, than Australia is, as we can see here as well. So we can look across countries, that's kind of interesting, but of course in terms of developing your own political compass, a much more immediately pertinent question is how are you going to vote in our elections? So we can look at this compass in terms of the Australian parties as well. For example, in the most recent federal election, the parties can be plotted with their policies as follows. And this is quite surprising, I would say, because um, you would imagine if we were similar to the US with two major parties, Labour and the Coalition, that they would be on opposite sides of the spectrum. But they're not. The Labour Party and the Liberal National Coalition Party are relatively speaking in the same quadrant. They're both to the economic right, both generally supporting free markets and big business and not so much government intervention. Um, Labor a little bit less so for sure. For example, Labor's main policy going into the last federal election was about placing more restrictions on things to do with um, franking credits for shares and negative gearing policies for investment properties. So that brings them a little bit further to the left economically. Um, and Labor's also a little bit more in favor of personal freedom and less authoritarian. 
but generally speaking, they're actually not that far from each other. In fact, they are closer to each other than Labor and the Greens are to each other, even though Labor and the Greens are more natural political allies um, in, um, in these political machinations. We can also look at this in terms of media bias in Australia. And here we see why breaking things up into economics and personal freedom is quite useful because this graph here doesn't do that. It just talks about left and right. And it would be interesting to know, do we think we're talking about authoritarian spectrum or the economic spectrum? It's hard to say because this is data pulled by some guy on Reddit. So I don't know exactly how reliable it is. But again, it's interesting to, to see they've got two dimensions here, leaning left or leaning right. And um, also on the vertical axis, the quality of the publication. Now, the only one that I've written for on here is the conversation, which leans left according to this, which is probably true because most economics are a little bit on the left of things. I'm happy to see at least that it's high quality. I have my doubts that it's entirely accurate, this graph, because it puts the SBS and ABC News both as a center um, leaning uh, media institution. Um, I think it's a bit more to the left, but I do agree that it's high quality. So what's the point by all this? Well, I'm not out to try to influence your political leanings one way or the other, but I do want you to have all the information when you make your own political value judgments about where you sit. Your main deciding factor about where you're going to sit on the political compass has to do with what you see the role of government is along two dimensions. There's the social dimension, which is probably what most people think about with politics. Should the government intervene in your life or not? Should we leave it up to everyone else to have their own personal freedom? Well, that's the, the authoritarian dimension, the social dimension, but there's also the economic dimension. And the economic dimension is important, not just in terms of government intervention in markets. We'll see this both in the macro part coming up in the course, and we saw it before in the micro part. But what we've seen uh, in the previous supplement as well is that many things that are not about the economy can also be thought about in terms of markets. So we talked about things like organ transplants and uh, ivory sales and stuff like this. But there are other things where it is useful to think about things in terms of markets, even though it feels a bit funny at first, such as refugees. There is a market for people smuggling and the policies that the government put in place will have these sort of very market-like sort of effects. The same for climate change. You think you can't put a price on the environment, but you can put a price on the environment and what's the best and most effective way to reduce the dead weight loss in the market for say emissions um, when we take into account these externalities. The key takeaway point from this supplement is to tell you that both sides of politics use or try to exploit theories that you've already learned in this course to get across their point. And you should be able to see through all the rhetoric now to work out which of their points make sense, which don't make sense, and which ones you agree with, which ones you don't agree with. And this can start all the way at the very local level, including UQ's own student elections. So the next time that someone tries to throw a handful of pamphlets in your face at the food court, don't just walk past, ask them a few questions about economic theory, see where they stand. That's all. I hope you enjoy this supplement. See you next time.